this group is having some more food. Um, thank you very much for coming and staying on this late Friday evening. We know most of you are now looking forward to the big event tonight. But this panel uh, is something we are glad to do. We uh, have spent um, the whole day uh, talking on our project, and these people are the, the project participants and partners. But now we are uh, happy to do this uh, uh, panel uh, that we have called uh, Sanctuary in the City. This title is inspired by uh, Alexander Batts uh, lecture later tonight, and um, it's also uh, a topic of several of the research projects that we have starting now in 2019 with funding from the Research Council of Norway and the EU, and I'm doing this with my colleague, <coughs> Sarah Togan, mm. sitting here. Um, you can also read more about these uh, projects at CMI website, if you should be interested, that is. Um, before I, want to, uh, before I continue, I just want to, uh, you to give a big welcome to the panel. I just said their names quickly. This is Jeff Crisp, Nasser Yassin, Sinna Bergby, Lavar Aldin, and Alex Batz. So please give a welcome to them. I'll present them more, I'll present them in more detail later. Um, so the background to this, these projects we are doing and to this panel is the fact that an increasing number of refugees live in poor neighborhoods in towns and cities across the Middle East, which is a premier refugee region with one of the world's highest urbanization levels. So you have refugees, urban refugees, and high urbaniza urbanization levels together. While host states have taken in millions of refugees, they have not had the resources to provide for them. Aiding refugees living in cities and urban areas is therefore a major challenge to humanitarian policy. For many refugees, cities are viewed as their best option to provide for themselves and their families. In fact, refugees are sometimes leaving camps and moving into cities. However, cities can also turn into poverty traps, where the refugees survive below subsistence levels. Urban refugees also compete with other urban dwellers, and especially urban poor, for um, housing, jobs and services. All of these are in limited supply. They can also strain host guest relations and cause a backlash against refugees, both at the local and the national level, and indeed leading to calls for sending refugee, refugees back against their will or also back to unsafe areas. So um, the whole question of urban refugees in the Middle East is a, is a really, really important issue, we think, and it seems like uh, that's also the case with, <laughs> since with the applications we sent. So, with the size and complexity and cost of living in cities account for some of the problems facing refugees, we think that cities are also part of the solution. Cities have larger and often unregulated labor markets, there are more shelter options, and they have ready access to health and school facilities, although these health and skills facilities are always or mostly overtaxed, overburdened, and in a very weak state. So obviously, there is a, there is a, there is a, a mismatch between demand and supply. Cities and towns can also offer greater freedom of movement and foster self-reliance, as well as provide better <coughs> prospects for successful socio-economic integration and entrepreneurship. So there are advantages to cities, we think, and this is an under, underexplored issue, research-wise. Now, in this panel, we will start a discussion uh, on how to assist urban displaced in the 21st century. A tall order, uh, but a very important one. So how can humanitarian policies be redesigned to accommodate refugees in urban areas? Indeed, can refugees find sanctuary in the city? Is it possible to think that refugees can actually find a sustainable livelihood in cities and be accepted as long-time city dwellers. We think that is a possibility. The question is, how should you do it? Also, how can host countries and donors assist uh, refugees living among urban poor in inner city slums? So you have this competition there. You have urban refugees, poor, living among other poor. We see this in Lebanon. The situation is probably the same across the Middle East. So 
because of the low cost refugees moving to poor areas where they meet other poor people living equally difficult and they compete for the same resources. And in fact, refugees sometimes get support so they might be better off. Now, could so-called area-based or place-based solutions where refugee and local communities are targeted for support, infrastructure and improvements be some part of the solution? So moving from what is called person-centered to place-centered approaches. These are some of the questions that uh, we plan to study over the years in the projects we're doing. But also to help us kick off this debate here, uh, or maybe better the conversation, we have a distinguished panel of combining researchers, uh, practitioners and urban specialists covering you know, med many Middle East countries. Um, we're also especially glad to have Alex Batz with us, this uh, evening's speaker. He will speak about, uh, he will give some East African examples of this. So uh, I will then uh, move on to the, um, uh, before I move on to the first speaker, I just want to state very quickly that, of course, the Middle East countries are quite diverse. In some of the countries, we have security issues, very difficult security issues, like in Iraq, which will be touched upon by Dlavar al uh, In Lebanon, we have, a, a, we have this huge number of refugees compared to the, to the population. And these countries also have different approaches. Lebanon doesn't formally have cap camps, although they have some. Uh, other, ca other countries do camps. But across Middle East, most of the refugees are living outside camps. Maybe less than 8% are in camps. This shows two things. It shows that camps are not the major you know, uh, support mechanism. You must find solutions outside camps. So um, the first speaker then, let me introduce the first speaker. That is, um, I think we start from the left with uh, Jeff Crisp. Jeff really doesn't need an introduction. He is, uh, I mean, a living legend, <laughs> I think. In, re in refugee research. Um, he's an expert on refugee migration and humanitarian issues, and he's a very, very influential voice in refugee policy and research. So I think when Jeff spe speaks, at least the refugee community listens. Just, Jeff has had a, held a, a lot of senior positions. He's then been a director of research at UNHCR, at Refugees International, at the Global Commission on International Migration, and he is currently an associate of Chatham House in London and, of course, of the Refugee Study Centres in Oxford. So maybe to bring us into some of these urban issues, uh, of course, you, many of you would know that Jeff has been instrumental in, in, uh, in, in uh, overseeing, uh, guiding uh, much of the work on uh, refugee policy, protected refugees in the UNHCR. I think there's no one better to do that than Jeff. So we'll, we'll now start and give them like uh, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes each and go the full round. We'll wait with Alex, he will come last and we'll be introduced by Sarah. So we'll start with Jeff and then I'll next introduce uh, Nasser when he's been. So please, Jeff. Okay, thanks yeah, very thank much. You. I, I don't normally like going first, but in this case, maybe it's you most appropriate. It right <laughs> uh, in the sense that I'm going to provide a very brief but broad overview of the whole situation of okay, refugees in urban areas, and I'm sure my colleagues will delve more specifically into some of the specifics. So to begin with, I think if I was to go out on the street and just grab a few people uh, at random and say to them, what do you think of when I use the word refugee? I think it would be quite common for people to come up with the following image. They'd be talking about kind of a large expanse of desert, lots of white tents where the refugees are living, relief agencies delivering trucks of relief supplies, people queuing up with plastic buckets and bowls for food, and probably Angelina Jolie coming in on a helicopter <laughs> above them. Um, and that kind of traditional image of the refugee living in a camp being serviced by aid agencies, I think it's often, even today, reinforced by the kind of images that are published by aid agencies. If you look at the UNHCR website, the Twitter account of many aid agencies, you will find they have this kind of incredible fascination with refugee camps and with tents. Uh, I never quite understood why, but they still do. But in practice, of course, that kind of traditional image of refugees living in tents and living in camps is an increasingly inaccurate picture of the global refugee situation. Um, and of the statistics are not absolutely conclusive, but I think we can say with quite a high degree of confidence that in the world today, well over 50% of the refugees are living outside of camps. And when I say outside of camps, I'm talking about kind of three specific uh, dimensions of the issue. Firstly, refugees living in cities, towns, and in urban areas. 
Secondly, refugees living amongst host communities, alongside the host community, but in more rural areas. And then finally, the kind of informal settlements that we see, particularly in Lebanon, where kind of informal camps have grown up, but the tents and the shelters have actually been constructed by refugees themselves. But if you add up the total number of refugees living in those three contexts, I think you'd probably come to at least 60 to 65 or even 70 percent of the world's refugee population living outside of camps. And I think since the 1990s, there's been a kind of quite an intensive debate on how to respond to this development. The fact that refugees are to be found not in camps, but in urban areas and in other locations. And I guess to simplify a quite a long and complex debate, uh, there's been two kind of schools of thought. Uh, the first school of thought to which I guess I would belong myself has been to say, look, we have to recognise the new realities. In many cases, refugees are leaving camps and going to urban areas because they can't fulfil their needs and aspirations by living in a camp. Increasingly, we saw that refugees were bypassing camps altogether and not even bothering to register in a camp, but going straight from their country of origin to um, a city in a country of asylum. We saw a growing number of countries who didn't actually want to establish camps on their territory and where living in a camp was not even an option for the refugees living in that country. So for people in that school of thought, including myself, the basic message was we need to adjust to this new reality and we need to adjust our policies and programmes to correspond to the new location of refugee, uh, refugees around the world. On the other hand, there was some kind of resistance um, to this acceptance of refugees in urban areas being the new reality and the new phenomenon. For host states, host states in many cases like to have the visibility that refugee camps provide. If you can take donors to see a big refugee camp, the argument went that it made it easier for you to show uh, the size of the refugee population, it made it easy to raise funds on behalf of that population and the agencies assisting them. Uh, host states also argued that for security reasons, it was much better to keep refugees confined to camps rather than letting them spread out across the country and taking residence wherever they chose to do so. Similarly, despite all of the arguments in favour of focusing more on urban refugees, there were personnel within the aid agencies, including UNHCR, who argued that this would not be a positive step. They would said that for log logistical reasons, it's much easier to meet the needs of refugees if they're all concentrated in one particular location rather than scattered across a very vast urban la landscape, as you would get in Cairo or New Delhi or Nairobi, for example. Some people in aid agencies also argued that it was easier to register refugees, it was easier to identify vulnerable people if they were to be maintained in specific locations, namely refugee camps. More generally, there was a feeling both amongst refugee hosting states um, and amongst some aid agency personnel that if you try to provide assistance and protection to refugees in urban areas, this would in some respect act as what they called a pull factor. It would actually encourage people to leave camps and bypass camps and the consequence of that would be that more and more people would show up in urban areas. It would impose greater and greater pressures on the limited resources in those areas. It would almost inevitably lead to conflict with the local urban poor and that would itself be bad for protection. Now, that debate between the two, two schools of thought on uh, urban refugees has not been entirely resolved. But on the one hand, U UNHCR for the last 10 years has pursued a new policy towards urban areas, which stipulates that refugees should be allowed to take up residence wherever they choose to, including in towns and cities, even if the governments of host states didn't approve of that situation. Um, at the same time, UNHCR has always conceded that refugees in urban areas should only receive minimal and specialised forms of assistance. They shouldn't be provided with a general food ration, as happens in a camp situation. So in general, the UNHCR policy has been that refugees should only receive assistance if they have specific vulnerabilities. For example, they're elderly, they're sick, they're single women with children, they have mental health issues, or they're absolutely destitute. But otherwise, when a refugee comes into an urban area, they take their own chances and they're expected to look after themselves. So the debate hasn't been entirely resolved, but there is, I think, a general uh, agreement that we should focus more now on refugees out of camps and in camps. Now, this um, new situation that I've described has raised a number of different issues. Some of them were mentioned in the very useful introduction provided just a few minutes ago. So I'll quickly run through five of the key issues that I think have arisen as a result of this new focus 
on refugees living in urban areas. The first one is that of partnerships. Traditionally, UNHCR and other humanitarian organisations used to work with refugee na re national refugee commissions, with humanitarian ministries, with special units within governments that were dedicated to <coughs> refugee and international assistance. When you move into an urban context, you're obliged to work with a much newer and, more, and a different range of partners, including mayors, municipalities, local councils, civil society, neighbourhood associations, etc. The question I want to raise there, has UNHCR and other humanitarian agencies made that kind of operational adjustment to working with this new range of partners? Secondly, the whole notion of protection perhaps has to be rethought or reconsidered in the urban context. What are the specific problems and threats and vulnerabilities that refugees encounter when they move in to an urban area. There are certain issues that are more likely to confront them there than perhaps in a camp situation. Exploitation by landlords, eviction by, uh, sorry, exploitation by their employers, eviction by landlords, etc. Harassment by the police forces that are to be found in urban areas. So what does protection mean more specifically in an urban context. Mm. Thirdly, and I'm sure that Alex will say a lot more about this in his presentation today and, uh, well, this afternoon and this evening, the whole question of livelihoods. It's, I think there's a general agreement it's much better that refugees living in urban areas should, to the extent possible, be able to meet their own needs and to become, uh, to use uh, a rather vague word, self-reliant. But there is a debate as to how best to do that. What are the different options if you're trying to uh, increase the opportunities of refugee um, self-reliance, and there have been a number of different answers to that question. Should most of the emphasis be placed on the legal basis, um, providing people with the right to work legally in the labour market? Should it be the establishment of income generating programmes for refugees? Should it be trying to establish new job opportunities, particularly working closely with the private sector? And to what extent should development actors be involved in enabling urban refugees to establish their own livelihoods? A fourth issue that has been raised in the urban context is that of the host communities. Uh, the risk that uh, host communities could be marginalised, that the too much focus might be given on the refugees and not enough attention given to the people living in the same location, off of whom many of whom suffer their own hardships and difficulties. Um, which raises an institutional issue: who is actually ultimately responsible for the host community? Is it the local government? Does UNHCR, which is obviously mandated to be a refugee protection agency, does the UNHCR have a responsibility also for host sectors, for host, for host communities? And then finally, what about the development actors that I've already mentioned? To what extent um, do host communities come under the general aegis of development actors? And then final issue I'd just like to put on the table is that of security. Um, I think history has shown that Refugees in urban areas uh, are often perceived as some kind of a threat. Um, it's true that in some instances they've been liable to organise protests and demonstrations. And in many situations, such protests and demonstrations have been met by force by the local police and security services. A very tragic example of this took place in Cairo in 2005 when the uh, Sudanese, um, sorry, the Egyptian um, Security services basically committed a massacre against protesting Sudanese refugees in Cairo, leading to large-scale loss of life. So I think the final issue that I'd like to put on the agenda is how to avoid such deadly scenarios. Does it come through the training of the police and security services? Could we do more in terms of community-based peace and reconciliation initiatives? Do we need to also provide training to refugees themselves, informing them not only of their rights, but also of the obligations that they accept when they take up residence in an urban area? So I think urban refugees are very much on the agenda at the moment, but still quite a large number of unresolved issues that we need to continue to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so many of these issues that Jeff uh, mentioned is, of course, relevant to Lebanon, where the situation now is changing from uh, sort of a more protracted refugee situation to uh, uh, some start of uh, repatriation, both forced and voluntary. And I think no one better to bring us into that than Nasser Yassin. Uh, Nasser is a professor at the American University of Beirut. He is also director of the Islam Forest Institute, which is a major ho policy hub in Lebanon, I would say in the region even. Um, Nasser is also deeply involved with the AUB for Refugees. It's a, it's a, a university-wide initiative uh, that deals with the impact of the refugee crisis, Syrian refugee crisis in uh, Lebanon. Uh, 
uh, and they are also become quite influential. They have a very influential Twitter feed. Is that correct? Yes. No, sir? Yeah, and they also do you know daily WhatsApp messages. So uh, with these words, I give the word to Nasser. He has been uh, involved in many CMI projects. We are glad to have him back for this one. So, thank you so much. It's uh, good to be back to back to Bergen. Is it okay the distance? It's fine. Yeah, good because we've been trying to manage the distance. Um, so I'll uh, say a few words about the situation in Lebanon, uh, not particularly on urban refugees, but the refugee question at the moment in Lebanon and how things have been going for the last uh, seven to eight years. Um, probably you know, um, this is, there's a competition, by the way, by countries who's hosting more refugees. <laughs> They're always competing. But Lebanon is, is truly hosting the highest uh, uh, number of refugees per capita. So 20 to 25% uh, of the population at the moment is refugee. Mostly Syrian refugees, around 1 million. Uh, registered, maybe the government says more. Uh, and of course, uh, there are roughly around 250,000 Palestinian refugees, protracted refugees, but also other smaller like Iraqis and others. And, uh, and honestly, the question that I started working on or trying to address a few years back was in the summer or towards the end of summer 2015. And particularly when the news was coming from Europe that there is a huge migration crisis. That's exactly when I started to ask myself the different questions that we were addressing before 2015. Before 2015, we were looking into the needs, into the services, into different sectors, as the UN lingo says, you know, shelter, livelihood, social cohesion, and so on. But after 2015, or the end of it, when the crisis actually was phrased or framed in Europe, I started to ask myself the question, I mean, why this small country, and at that time, we didn't have a president, we didn't have a government, the, 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 the parliament was locked for two years. It was real political crisis, you know? I mean, it's Sounds like the UK, actually. But <laughs> it's, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but why at that moment, the idea of having a refugee crisis in Lebanon was not so put out, maybe we had other crises, but it wasn't seen as this burdening crisis, although you're actually hosting the same number that came to Europe. So, and Europe got 1 million or 1.2 uh, million, mostly went to uh, Germany and Sweden, mostly Germany. So I started to ask myself a question, why the country hasn't actually uh, collapsed? What are the systems in Lebanon that are keeping the country uh, uh, standing? At least with this minimal, way of standing in, in place of this crisis. And, you know, as, as someone, you know, uh, comes maybe from development background, development studies, I started to look into history. And of course, Lebanon historically, like many countries, but Lebanon in particular, has been a host country to a lot of refugees. So there's a lot in the history. Since, you know, the beginning of the nation state of Lebanon as a nation state in the early 20, 1920s, Lebanon has hosted Armenian refugees, first waves, coming from Turkey uh, after the genocide. Uh, then later, 1948, Palestinians, large number of them. And later, there's a huge number of Lebanese actually displaced within the country. And then, you know, Iraqis and recently Syrians. So there's a history. And, and, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the history, but, but most of the refugees, as a matter of fact, and this will move me to the other point on geography, tend to move to where those places have been historically places to host refugees. So actually the places that Armenians lived in in the 1920s and 30s or moved in were, became the places for the Palestinians who moved in 1948, and then for those internally displaced or internally migrants, Lebanese moved in, and then later for Iraqis and Kurds and, 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 uh, and recently for the Syrians. Not, of course, Syria is, is the biggest crisis, but those places become the magnets for refugees. So this, there's a lot also, not only in the history, but also in the geography of looking into the geography of displacement, but also geography of, of settlement, where people live in and how they actually choose. And a lot of this has to do, I'm not inventing anything, with the informal housing market, because those places are not regulated, they're informal, anyone can come in, rent, uh, without needing any paperwork. So that was a key you know, a factor in absorbing the large number of refugees because of the informal housing market. But the third point is actually in the political economy. Uh, Lebanon historically has uh, relied on the Syrian workforce. Uh, 
Uh, actually, throughout the 90s and the post-Civil War period in Lebanon, the workforce that rebuilt the country was Syrian, predominantly Syrian. And until now, predominantly, those who work in the construction sector are actually Syrian, but also in farming and as other basic jobs. And, and actually, uh, John Chalcroft from LSE says maybe around 800,000 Syrian mm -hmm. workers were at the highest of the season of getting you know, migrant workers from Syria. And they were allowed to come in and work till now without any work permit. Because at that time, the late Hariri, who was you know, leading the reconstruction you know, uh, period in Lebanon, uh, agreed with Hafez al-Assad to uh, get the Syrians to work without any work permit, because he was looking for cheap sources of labor. And I looked further into the info, and of course, almost all of the Syrians actually working in the informal economy. And the informal economy is, is huge in places like Lebanon. It's almost 50% of the workers in Lebanon and of the small businesses are actually informal. Maybe now it's even more with the Syrian presence of Lebanon. So it's not only the, the Syrians, but also Palestinians and many Lebanese operate informally without work permits, without uh, any system that you know, uh, uh, regulates their employment or their small businesses. It has, of course, its negative dimension, but it has also its positive dimensions in actually absorbing this large number of people moving in into your economy. Of course, social relations were strong. Almost all refugees, almost all, not all of them, but almost all of them, particularly in the early you know, years, two years, when there's a massive movement from Syria to Lebanon, moved to places they already had some connection with. So the social networks are quite you know, strong. So that would explain, for example, if you know the ge geography of Lebanon, why certain refugees went up to Bshirri. This is like a Maronite high Christian area up in the mountains. I, I've never been there, so, but why a refugee would go there? <laughs> you know, I mean, it has to do because maybe some Syrian man was doing some assisting a farmer there, so he brought in his family. And as a matter of fact, when you look into the demography of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon, 81% are women and children. So it actually tells a lot that those who were working in Lebanon or had some kind of a economic relation with Lebanon brought in their families. That's at least at the beginning of the crisis. So that would explain a lot how things were kept under control in the early you know, years of the crisis. So that's what, what, we, what, what development theorists call resilience. I don't know what it means, honestly. But we call it the informal adaptive mechanisms. It's actually a sense of allowing refugees to cope with the impacts of their displacement, this huge experience, negative experience that they went through of being you know, uh, 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 you know, uprooted from, their, from the places of residence to another country. Actually, they coped quite relatively well. Uh, of course, there were NGOs in Lebanon. Historically, it's a strong non-governmental sector. UN organizations came in, local authorities were also supporting them. So that's kind of the big picture around how things were, at least in, in the 2016-17, things were, uh, you know, and to, until now, in my opinion, are still under control. Why things haven't actually imploded in the country. With, the, with all of this, the, the, the response, you know, the response machine or system brought to fit anything between one to $1.5 billion a year into the country. So with some multiplier effect, that might, might become around $2, million, $2 billion a year. Lebanon has a small economy, $45 billion of GDP. So $2 billion, particularly being spent among the, uh, for the refugees or to the refugees, and among the poor communities in Lebanon, would actually create some kind of difference. And that was also something that kept things at least uh, you know, uh, uh, above the level of water before uh, sinking. But, and, and uh, of course, refugees have a lot of agencies. Syrians in particular are entrepreneurial. They took a lot, actually, of self-help mechanisms. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but we're doing research into how they actually help each other. And, and, and really, it's, uh, it's interesting when you look into some of the really grassroots uh, community-based mechanisms that Syrians have established among themselves to help each other. It could be kin-based, could be village-based, tribal-based, but actually it's very interesting, and uh, I can tell you later some of these stories. But what's happening at the moment, this is some kind of, these, those coping mechanisms are like an elastic cord. That's how I usually visualize it, you know? So it kept them standing on the brink of, of falling. 
And you know, the UNHCR comes and gives them you know, $200 a month. Uh, WFE brings them the, uh, the food uh, you know, through this system uh, called Louise, like a like debit card, which is actually quite interesting as a system. And NGOs come in, Islamic organizations come in, family helps. But this is actually, it's getting to crack. So it's a cord. They've been standing on the cliff, and I feel now it's being eroded. And it's, there's, it's, it's actually getting weaker and weaker as a cord. I'm out of time. Half a minute. Half a minute? I still have to say the second part of the story. And it has to do with the three points that I mentioned, actually. The weaknesses of it has, has to, the weaknesses have to do with the three points. It's history, geography, and the economy. So again, those that I think and thought early on that they were actually factors that helped to keep refugees floating and their host communities accepting them is actually been affecting themselves the weaknesses in this in these adaptive mechanisms. And the first is the history. Lebanon has a negative history with Syrians and Palestinians. So that's how Lebanon actually did not accept to have camps. They thought camps would actually bring in the security image of the Palestinian fidayeen carrying in arms. And, and, and I think we have to accept that. That's happened in the 70s and 80s. So there's no way to accept to have camps in Lebanon. But also there's an image in a lot of the you know, uh, collective memory of the Lebanese that Syrians contributed negatively to the, to the war. And it's been getting back again, you know. So now, in the first couple of years, they accepted them. Now they see there's a lot of negati negativity towards them. But also the geography itself, and Ari mentioned this early on, 87% of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon live among the poorest Lebanese, so among where 67% of the poor Lebanese live. So it's actually the poor Lebanese, around 1 million of them, the poorest, are hosting those poor ref Syrian refugees. Those areas are neglected historically, so you can imagine all the, you know, uh, this recipe for a lot of tension and competition and so on. And the economy has been weak in Lebanon because of the Syria crisis, because of the regional crisis and the regional economy. So what to do? I mean, all of these are signs of fatigue. There's a lot of fatigue happening among the communities, among refugees. And I think, and I will, I will, end, uh, will end here, and perhaps we can do it later in a question and answer. You need to re, you know, uh, put some uh, uh, energy into those uh, uh, adaptive mechanisms. And one key, whether, whether, how, how much we actually celebrate uh, resilience, informality, people coming together, grassroots, we still need the legal protection. That has been key in all of our research on shelter, on health, and education, on livelihood, any, on social relations. Whenever those refugees are legally protected, this is an entitlement as refugees, even if Lebanon does not have uh, the, is not signatory of the of the convention or the annexes or anything. They cannot actually. Lebanon has to give legal protection for refugees because if they are legally protected, and they are documented, and 73 percent of them actually don't have legal residency, so if they have the legal papers, they're documented well. They can operate even in the informal economy. They can all move around without fearing the harassment of the security or actually the landlord or someone abusing them. That's key. But also, we need to create this narrative that people have to work together. I'll stop here. Maybe I, I went over. Great. But, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Nasser. So uh, I'm, as mentioned by Nasser many times, crisis. I think one of the, one of the key words is sort of urban crisis with uh, refugees either being part of it or contributing to it. And I think we are lucky to have with us Sina Belgbi, who is an urban development professional and architect. And Sinna worked uh, for four years with UN Habitat in uh, Beirut. And as a, in that capacity, she also helped develop and publish very, very significant and I think very interesting and important reports called City Profiles, including the City Profile on Tripoli, which is a northern city with, with a lot of uh, refugees, Syrian refugees present. So very glad to have Sinna here today. Uh, at the moment, Sinna is back in Norway. She runs her own uh, consultancy firm called Urban A. So, Sina, thank God for coming. Please, the word is yours, or the thank floor you. is yours. Um, so, so, I'm happy to be part of this panel and also uh, perhaps to, uh, to talk a little bit about the kind of practical challenges in, in terms of developing uh, some response programs. So, um, 
obviously with the, the crisis. I'd like to come closer. To a bit closer. <laughs> um, obviously with the crisis in, in Lebanon starting to emerge from 2011, but then increasingly in scale in, from 2013 on, it took quite a bit of time before it was an agreement that there was also an urban impact of the crisis. So, um, a key obstacle for the comprehensive urban uh, response in Lebanon was the lack of granular data. So, so there was a registration of the refugees that was done on the cadastral level, um, which is uh, sometimes uh, the same as a municipality, but not always, and it's a little bit of a mix, and, and no one really understands what the different admin levels is. But um, for certain regions, that meant that you had uh, uh, refugees registered to areas that you you didn't really know if it was a city or not, and it it didn't fall within agreed upon city boundaries. Um, that meant that internally in the UN uh, there was a lot of discussions if if the refugee crisis was indeed rural, urban, something in between, uh, and whatnot. So. Um, what we started to do was to really look at the data that was already collected and overlaying that with satellite imagery. Um, but that started in, in 2014, moved towards uh, a kind of a, an initial interest, so to say, not an agreement, but an interest to, to kind of scope more uh, what was actually the impact on, on the cities. And then, of course, we found that a lot of the refugees had indeed settled in neighborhoods that was already uh, pre-crisis, affected by several waves of, of uh, migration, uh, displacement, and also urban poverty. And of course, it's, it's uh, in some sort of logical sense, it, it was logic that most of the refugees settled if, as they were seeking affordable housing, you settle where there are buildings and the buildings uh, follow the population, and 87% of the Lebanese population is indeed living in urban areas. Um, so the, the lack of data both masked the urban vulnerabilities and understanding of uh, the displacement in Lebanon, but also, of course, the opportunity to have a systems approach to uh, the crisis. That meant that you would rather look at uh, a people-centered uh, approach looking for specific vulnerabilities among certain families, and you didn't really have the capacity to target the systems. So to give a couple of examples, uh, early on, so that means when I say early on from 2013 and, and up to 2015, it's not really early on in a uh, humanitarian crisis that has already lasted for four years. But at that point, we found that we had provided internally in the UN a lot of garbage trucks to, to one region in, in Lebanon. Uh, looking at the use of these garbage trucks, they were most of the day standing still. When garbage was collected, it was just dumped uh, in, in formal illegal sites, burned, um, and still a lot of people uh, didn't have uh, any, any uh, solid waste collection nearby their houses. Uh, and starting to discuss this problem with the local authorities, of course, they didn't have fleet management plans. They didn't receive any support uh, in terms of how to use the equipment. They received a number of, of uh, initiatives from different uh, donor and UN agencies, more and more equipment, uh, um, which also looked very good. So it was visible, and you could kind of um, report that you had provided uh, trucks and, and bobcats and, and whatnot. And uh, we also found, for instance, uh, in, in some of the schools that we studied, uh, that you suddenly had uh, a school where the Lebanese students were receiving um, uh, education in the toilet of the school. Not because there were Syrian refugees in that particular school, but because you had overlooked looking at the kind of comprehensive uh, impact of, of the crisis and also what was the pre-crisis situation for these uh, particular areas. So what we, what was key for us in developing an urban response program for, for the UN, but also specifically for UN Habitat where I worked, was to develop these urban profiling tools. Yeah. Um, and we looked at both the city and neighborhood level, both to kind of get a more comprehensive understanding, linking different uh, 
cities and different urban areas, but also to have the granularity of a neighborhood level uh, that would allow us to, to uh, both understand the influx of refugees to particular areas, and what that meant to social and basic service provision, but also as well economy and social cohesion in a, in a spatial manner. And then, of course, to come up with spatial strategies um, in, in, or in order to respond, and not least to have a shared understanding between the donor community, the international uh, response community, and local and national authorities. Um, so developing the tools uh, was quite a bit of a process, and as I said, it, it kind of kicked off from 2015. 2016, 2017 was used to come up uh, with uh, some of the initial analysis and present that to, to the larger community. And it was first in 2017 that there was kind of a, a more formal agreement with both government and the UN agencies that this was in fact an urban crisis. That meant that we looked at how we, we developed the UN strategic framework and the Lebanon crisis response plan uh, differently. And, but up until that point, it was more of a kind of struggle to, to really highlight these, uh, these issues. And of course, these, uh, these spatial analysis uh, tools, they were also tested and, and developed with, uh, uh, I mean, adapted to the local context also in Syria and Iraq and, and now being implemented in Libya and, and Yemen as well. Um, so, uh, of course, that those uh, those profiles they, they look at the service provision and the access to services, but in Lebanon, uh, <laughs> yeah, key aspect was also to just understand what the city was like. So, uh, the last population census in Lebanon was in 1932. And of course, there's a huge debate about the, the refugee population numbers. But when you have uh, population data for the host community that dates almost 100 years back, um, I, you speculate a lot. Uh, and again, this hinders. So if, you, if you want to plan, be it uh, basic service provision, education, health, uh, or understand conflict patterns or social cohesion, you actually need to know who lives there. Uh, and and um, uh, the population data that we collected at the neighborhood level was, uh, I wouldn't say accurate, but we actually counted the number of people per apartment, which is obviously not something you can do uh, in, in all humanitarian contexts. It's time consuming and it's very costly. But in Lebanon, that was actually the level of granularity in the profiling that we had to go to, to be able to use that data to build capacities for the kind of longer, longer uh, term. But um, needless to say, uh, th th there are questions on political willingness to go into that kind of data collection, um, and also uh, reluctancy amongst the donor community to kind of fund that uh, type of approach uh, during a crisis. Um, and within that uh, field of, of uh, one agency deciding, okay, so we're going to do this comprehensive neighborhood profiling in the middle of an emergency. Of course, there is a lot of discussions amongst the UN agencies, and, and it's a kind of uh, freedom for me to talk about it now because now I'm outside the UN. But um, I don't know how many hours I spent in internal UN debates and, and political uh, kind of competition between the UN agencies and internally in the UN agencies to define what should be the priorities uh, who should do profiling, who should uh, engage with which uh, local stakeholders. And often you find that, of course, you have overlapping mandates to some degree, but you also have overlapping interests and, and um, uh, uh, donor communities that also not necessarily always on the same page before they approach the various agencies. Um, uh, um, discussion in this approach of so the the tools that we developed was very much the kind of starting point for developing an area-based uh, approach so you do the profiling and you develop a response plan for that particular area but of course if you map out 
uh, a neighborhood with, let's say, 20,000 inhabitants that has been uh, poor for, for decades, what you will come up when you do that full profiling is, is obviously needs of a huge scale, uh, which will require millions of implementation, uh, uh, which means that it's, it's not as simple as just kind of coming up with an area-based approach and then, then you will be able to meet the needs. You actually need to also know what kind of funding streams and uh, the taxation <laughs> systems in that country uh, can't actually be overlooked when looking at it. And a final point is also that in the, the lack of these, um, this granular data and agreement on, on targeting, uh, a lot of the agencies were in fact supporting uh, decentralized and informal systems uh, of service provision, meaning that even though uh, the UN especially uh, argues that uh, um, service provision in, in Lebanon needs to be, uh, I mean, uh, increased and, and increased capacity at a local municipal level, the different agencies are supporting the, the informal systems, which sometimes hinders, in fact, the, the local capacity uh, building. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sina. Um, so to stay on the, this crisis uh, narrative, uh, one of the countries we hear, I think, the least about when it comes to refugees is uh, Iraq, where you have a major security uh, crisis and a very difficult situation for refugees living in cities like Mosul and Dohuk and Erbil. And very glad now to bring in our fourth speaker, Glover uh, uh, Aladin, who is, uh, has a distinguished career as a medical doctor educated in the UK. He is the founder and president of the Middle East Research Institute, which is one of our partners. And he is also a former minister in, uh, in the Kurdish government. So he should be very well placed to uh, answer these questions. So please, Glover, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I try to forget all of those yeah. <laughs> roles that I played because otherwise I'll be in the wrong place. Right. And um, it's not like a good qualification to have been a medic on this panel or a minister of government or whatever. But uh, I thank you, Ari, for bringing us together and, uh, and having such a distinguished people and such a good audience. And Bergen uh, um, bringing us from the son of uh, Middle East to the reign of uh, Bergen. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, uh, actually, I myself, um, I'm a typical refugee, so don't think about the stereotype that you described. Um, actually, they all look like me. <laughs> um, I was a refugee. And actually, uh, everyone I know uh, in Kurdistan was a refugee at some point, and everyone I know in Baghdad, um, whether they are the ruling elite or they are um, whoever, the entire population, so refugee, population displacement, uh, internal displacement is nothing new to us. Um, that's our life. One day Shias are refugees in Iran. One day Sunnis are actually the underdogs and they are running for their lives. Kurds are one day refugees, one day they're hosts. They uh, look after refugees, except that they don't know how to. <laughs> so we, we've, we know what, how, what to be, how to be refugees and go all the way to Europe. Uh, anywhere you want. Now, the diaspora is so wide, but actually to have the institutions of the state, to have the uh, policies, to have what it takes to look after refugees and make sure that generations are not lost and they recover, they uh, contribute to the well-being of your country. We don't know how to. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have uh, states like ours, uh, this is really where the challenge is. So what is new now, not the refugee status that is new, what is new is that Suddenly, we have this large number. The magnitude of the problem is beyond anything we've ever imagined. The longevity of it, for years and years, these waves keep coming. It's well beyond the capacity of anybody to handle them. And what also has changed is the dynamics, the security dynamics of the region. There used to be like the, the good, bad, and ugly, or the east-west, or, e or the two superpowers, who all you needed to do is to go to Washington and Moscow, and then you know what to predict for the next 10 years, and then you can handle all the wars, all the conflicts, and all the refugees. All of that is fine. Now the two superpowers have lost influence. They are irrelevant in our region. And the most, uh, the richest region, the, the one richest with conflict, with diversity, ethnicity, uh, resources, oil, gas, you name it, we've got it. So uh, 
uh, this area suddenly found itself in the, uh, the mercy of uh, rival regional powers, none of which are interested in stability, democracy, rule of law. And the future, well, this is entire neighborhood is now in the hand of people who actually are inextricably linked between state and non-state actors. All of them are international, by the way. It's non-state actors, armed, not armed. Terrorists, le legitimate, illegitimate, they're all there. They all can drive agenda. They're all independent. They all have international dimensions. So we have this local actors, national actors, uh, regional actors, global actors, all intertwined, creating an environment of a, a never-ending turmoil, crisis after crisis. And guess what? They've turned the entire region, the states of the region, into fragile states, failing states, with these communities all polarized, fragmented, militarized. And what does that lead to? Population displacement, wars, conflicts, and, and lack of institutions that can actually deal with that. So Iraq is a typical state that not only it was for a century an area of conflict between ethnicities, uh, interests, and, and um, uh, um, all these uh, neighborhoods as a theater of wars, but now it's one of the most fragile states that is, on one hand, generating refugees, IDPs who then become refugees or, or, or so on, and it's also a host country for refugees. So we are now going through a phase where we are producing and exporting refugees, but now the international community, the Europeans coming to us to say, enough is enough. Why can't you look after them? Uh, why can't you keep them? And of course, we are talking about Iraq that is currently 39 million, and 25 years ago was half of that number. And um, in 2000, and, no, in 1979 um, was 13 million. Uh, people, and then in, in 1960-something, 60 65 or 6, it was 8.5 million. So uh, currently, we're increasing by 1 million per year. So with that, having a dysfunctional state, having bad economy, oil-dependent, rentier state, with such fragmentation, with such turmoil, with such fragility, I don't need to tell you about Iraq, because you're all experts now. Who's not an expert on Iraq? Everybody is. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you the, for the story from the end, rather than go back to history. 2014-2018 is an, an interesting phase where you have a fragile state already victim of this turmoil in the Middle East, became broken after ISIS broke part of it, even further broken when Erbil-Baghdad relation deteriorated and then the Kurds started having the referendum um, uh, exercise and for independence and then, and then the post-referendum violence. Then the oil tri uh, prices dropped uh, below even the cost, <laughs> almost. So the economy suffered disaster. That, and then up to 6 million people became displaced. So where do you get the money? Where do you get the state? Where do you get the, the politicians to focus on priorities? And of course, on top of that, poor institutionalization, uh, bad governance, corruption, no rule of law. So where, who are you going to talk to when you are talking about the fate of those refugees who are losing generations? So four years of that drove us to the bottom. Iraq almost didn't exist as a state. So with the international effort, with defeating ISIS, with the referendum becoming inconsequential, with the oil price uh, rising again, with all of this environment, suddenly Iraq stabilized. And there was this air of optimism. 2018, we saw two transformational uh, elections where Arbil Baghdad got together, the international community supported Baghdad, and everybody was hoping that we have a pro-American government in Baghdad, wishful thinking, of course. And then everybody started thinking, no, the Sunnis are going back, the Shias are wising up, and the Kurds are now supporting Baghdad. So there's optimism. And of course, ISIS was being defeated militarily. What is happening now? Guess what? The factors that led to the rise of ISIS and the breakup of Iraq and the further fragility are still there except they're a little bit worse now, okay? So we are facing the same poor governance, bad rule of law, corruption, as well as ill-focused government in Baghdad. We are still facing um, the rise of ISIS again, uh, but in the Al-Qaeda style. We are now um, uh, seeing that, that I Iraq, uh, in a way, unable to move forward with economic reform, with its capacity building to accommodate uh, refugees. When it comes to refugees, um, 
uh, my colleagues mentioned refugees, but we actually, with the 2011 uprising in Syria, we end up with a quarter of a million refugees. Refugees meaning coming across the border, okay? What is defined as border. There is no border, by the way. Everybody um, uh, trespasses the borders, including regional powers, global powers, mm -hmm. us, local powers, tribes, everybody. But if you come across the other side, if your identity is not Iraqi, you're a refugee. We have a quarter of a million of those. Half of, uh, half of those are in Erbil. Uh, the second biggest is in Duhok and then Soleimani. Mm -hmm. It was a pleasure to have them compared to the IDPs who are actually Iraqis. The Syrian refugees never had oil, never, ha never depended on the state, never had, never had cap in hand uh, waiting for the nanny state to actually uh, hand out um, food, ration, or anything else. They just got on with it. They went to the market, they started building, they were self-dependent, they, they brought food taste, they brought uh, uh, artistic touch to the reconstruction. It was a great pleasure to have them. And with eight years later, they, are, they don't see any prospect of going back. They're well accommodated, they're welcomed. And by the way, most of them are Kurds anyway. <laughs> so that means um, there's no reason for them to worry about the long-term process. And Baghdad didn't want to know them. Because they are Kurds, it's actually at the expense of KRG, and they wanted to punish the KRG anyway. So why should you bring it up to the international awareness and, and fight for their rights? So actually, the refugees are, on one hand, just by that nature, we're not creating crisis. But guess what happened? We then, in uh, 2013 onwards, we had waves of IDPs coming to Kurdistan. First from Anbar, then from uh, Tikri, then from Mosul. Four waves later, we had six million IDPs. Who would talk about refugees when you have such a crisis in a country that is already, without displaced people, it's in a crisis. A fragile state of that nature is already in crisis without crisis, okay? That's why Nebedu talked about uh, refugees. In, in fact, the refugees were in camps, the Syrian refugees, some of them in actually uh, among the um, residential settings and, and, and other settings. Um, well, I'm going to be the shortest presenter because I, I've only got two, more, two, three more minute, uh, two, three more points to make. So essentially what we end up with was six million people. But after 2018, 4.2 million went back home. We only have now 1.75 million IDPs uh, still uh, uh, displaced. Of those, 1.45 million are actually in the KRG areas. And within those, 80% are among people. 20% are in camps. And the IDPs, 40% are Sunni Arabs. 30% are Yazidis. And about 13% are Christians. And the rest are miscellaneous. So this is where we are. But what we do not have is this country, the state, doesn't have any policy about the future, about integration, about how to handle them. This is our, what our study should do. We should come up with clear recommendations. We are doing that as part of a bigger study in Kurdistan anyway. We need to come up with roadmaps and a good vision, a strategy, documents to say this is how it should be. But meanwhile, we've got the security issues. Uh, Hashd al-Shaabi is now dominating in the areas where people where most of the IDPs are, so people are not going back. Reconstruction hasn't started properly. Donor country, uh, countries pledged 30 million uh, of the 80 uh, billion that is required, 30 billion pledged by donor countries, but all conditional on the government doing what is right, and that's good governance and doing something about rule of law and la less corruption, which is not gonna happen. Therefore, we'll have no reconstruction started. Reconciliation has never uh, really moved forward. So who's going to then push these people back. And those who went back came back as, re as IDPs again. So we have secondary and tertiary uh, IDPs. So if you're encouraging the primary ones, they say, look at the secondary one. Would they go back? Well, now they've been back and they're uprooted again. We are in this kind of scenario. So these IDPs, if you ask them, and we did a survey for a, uh, a research council, the Dutch Research Council, uh, NWO, and the, the majority of the people who are in displacement now actually are thinking about coming to Europe. So get ready for it, basically. <laughs> uh, 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 and and, and the, the longer they stay, the, the more likely that they do. I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you all uh, for these really wonderful <laughs> short talks, uh, way too short, um, but really inspiring and insightful. So thank you. <laughs>
Our last speaker is Alexander Betts. He is the Leopold Muller Professor of Forced Migration and International Affairs and a fellow of Green Templeton College at the University of Oxford, where he previously was the Headley Bull Research Fellow in International Relations. He has his MPhil and DPhil as well from the University of Oxford, so you've been there for quite some time in various capacities. Um, he has worked for the UNHCR and as a consultant to the Council of Europe, as well as a number of other agencies. Um, his most recent book is co-authored with Paul Collier, uh, Refuge, Transfor Transforming a Broken Refugee System, which came out last year and has uh, facilitated a lot of international conversations about new governance um, and the new age uh, of refugees. So I will turn it over to you, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for letting me be a sort of interloper into this panel, even though I'm not part of the project. Um, I really enjoyed listening to the comments. I've enjoyed reading about the project. I think the idea of rethinking urban protection and assistance is really timely, very important. And thinking about concepts like having a place-based approach rather than a people-based approach, I think helps break down silos between refugees and host communities. What I'm going to try and do is offer some reflections based on my own research in East Africa, which in the urban context focuses mainly on Addis Ababa, Nairobi and Kampala, all of which ha happen to be capital cities and secondary city towns are also important for this discussion. And I'll say a number of things based on that experience, but try to relate them back to some of the things we've heard in this panel discussion from hopefully each and every one of the presenters, albeit briefly. Um, what we're doing in our research and refugee economies is looking at the urban context, but also the camp and settlement context. And it really resonates for me, as Sine said, the challenge of data. Because one of the things we've had to do in order to get random sampling and representative data from urban refugee communities is create our own sampling frameworks from scratch, mm -hmm. using things like satellite data, community representatives to walk around us, knock on, with us, knock on doors, ask, are you a refugee, before we can even begin the research. Mm -hmm. Because most international organizations don't have data on urban populations, and even where they do have urban data, we've discovered that it's generally out of date and wrong. So the data point really resonates. But what I'm hopefully drawing upon in my work is a mixture of qualitative and quantitative work, because we've tried to do some of that, thank you, um, that quantitative work, albeit based on um, creating our own sampling frames. The first point I want to make is around politics and law. Um, responses to urban displaced populations are embedded in politics. And that was one of the things I sort of wish I'd heard more of from the panel. And to understand that, we also need to historicize urban populations. One of the things that um, Jeff emphasizes very often in his work is the importance of refugee history. And we do it more often for camp environments and settlement environments than we do for urban areas. I just need to see my notes. Um, and when I've looked, for instance, in the Kampala context, as I've recently done at the archives, you find urban refugee populations discussed as early as the 1960s. So fascinatingly for me, as early as 1968, there was a discussion at UNHCR in Geneva with a delegation from Kampala about a population they called free livers, people who were in defiance of the then legal framework, the Aliens Control Act, by living outside the designated areas, but were living in the cities. And the reaction then of the government in Kampala was to say, that's fine with us. It's not bothering us. There's a contribution. Can we help them be self-reliant? Can we integrate them? Can UNHCR help with employment programs, etc.? So as early as the 1960s, there was that response of tolerance, irrespective of the legal framework, and to say, let's not enforce the legal framework. Let's be relaxed about it. There's a contribution. But we also see flip-flopping in that framework over time. So for instance, under Idi Amin's regime in the 1970s, Rwandese refugees were associated with the regime. So when Milton Obote comes to power in the early 1980s, he's keen to try, and he tries very hard, to expel Banya Rwanda and Rwandese refugees from the country, and certainly where possible, to move the 67,000 urban refugees, including those in Kampala, back to settlement or out of the country. And so you go with a shift from tens of thousands of urban refugees to a much lower figure 
with settlement policy being enforced. You similarly in the 1990s get a situation where Somali refugees start coming to Kampala. And by 1995, the government is also keen to ensure they're in the settlements and with UNHCR support, transfers Somalis from Kampala back to the Nakivali settlement. So the point there is when you look historically, you see the ebbing and flowing in the same country of degrees of tolerance, supposedly progressive policies at certain times in spite of restrictive legal frameworks. And now we have the Refugee Act, a supposedly progressive policy. You see currently Museveni trying to remove registration policies for refugees in Kampala and ensure registration takes place in the settlements. I think what that illustrates is that we need to historicize in our research, but also that politics often trumps law, sometimes progressively and sometimes regressively at the level of implementation. And I think that's a theme we also see a little bit in the Middle East context. So for instance, I've done a little bit of work with colleagues in Turkey, and one of the things that's important is the political role of municipal authorities and mayors. You see relatively more progressive policies in cities like Gaziantep and Adana mm. compared to say Izmir and Istanbul. That's partly due to the uh, political parties that are elected at the municipal level. It's partly due to the personalities of mayors, but they can make national policies more progressive or regressive. So I think placing the politics back into the conversation is a very important thing to do, both at the city level, but also the way the national level interfaces with it. The second theme I wanted to touch upon is, is a sociological theme, and it speaks very much to the idea of informal adaptive mechanisms, uh, as we heard. A key part of my research is looking at refugee-led protection and assistance. And at the level of both norms and registered organizations, refugee communities help themselves, particularly in urban areas. And in urban areas, they can often identify networks and resources to do that. So again, using Kampala as an example, we've mapped out over 40 registered refugee-led community-based organizations in that city from the Congolese community, the Somali community, the South Sudanese community, and many of them are providing services to the community at significant scale. So for instance, in the Congolese community, we have found three different organizations, Yarid, Hokwa, and Bondeko, all of whom have had budgets at some point in excess of 100,000 US dollars, providing very important and meaningful services. But they're largely locked out of the formal governance processes in terms of not meeting accounting standards, not meeting audit standards, not meeting vetting and compliance standards. And so they can't just go to donors for the most part and say, can we have funding? Their access to funding basically relies upon an informal chance meeting. Maybe their founder um, is employed by an NGO that supports them and mentors them. Maybe they have a chance meeting with a philanthropist. And that chance meeting allows them to create a network, and that network brings funding, allowing them to bypass formal mechanisms. But for the most part, they're locked out of the system. And it strikes me from looking at the kind of work they do that one of the most obvious changes that needs to happen in urban refugee policy is to ensure more work is done between international organizations, donors, national and local NGOs, and those refugee-led organizations. There's a political economy around that that's very important. In Kampala, one implementing partner, an organization called InterAid, has had a monopoly status on the UNHCR urban program since the 1990s. And it's been indirectly and directly highlighted for a whole series of elements of bad practice. But its status has never been questioned because it gets that status through a trilateral partnership between the organization, UNHCR, and the government. And so other competing organizations get locked out from the ability to be urban partners. And so I think that shows both that there are informal adaptive mechanisms at the level of norms, but also through registered organizations, but there's a political economy around who gets to be designated and identified as a legitimate provider. In part, donors have a valid concern about ensuring due diligence, capacity, and the reputational risk of working with small organizations. But the way to overcome that is to marry um, capacity building and mentorship with seed funding and ensure the funding is dispersed in an appropriate way. So I think that's a key part of what we need to do. Um, the other thing that I think is sociologically important to recognize 
in terms of adaptive mechanisms that I've seen a lot in these cities is the way in which refugees often work with host communities in mutually beneficial ways. So for instance, in Nairobi, um, where formerly refugees are not allowed to register businesses, they will often partner with a Kenyan business person who will formally register the business and they'll come up with a division of labor. We see that a lot in Eastleigh, where Somalis will work with an ethnic Somali Kenyan on a joint business initiative, and they'll have different strengths and comparative advantages. It might be that the refugee sits within a remittance network, for instance, and therefore is able to derive resources from a different source. It might be they provide the capital, but the host citizen is the link to the legal framework and the formal registration process. And in Addis, we see similar forms of interdependence. So for example, um, out-of-camp refugees living in Addis have to have a sponsor from the host community. And often that creates, um, amongst those, say, Eritrean refugees in Addis, a need to have an ongoing relationship. And the sponsorship can turn into joint entrepreneurship, collaboration, employment relationships. Sometimes they become exploitative, but it highlights that interdependence where we can't draw lines between the socio-economic and socio-cultural lives of one group and the other. Um, I next want to say something about geography, because I think the idea of having a place-based response rather than a people-based response is intuitively right. But it calls into question what place means in a city. And I, I don't want to sort of come across like a critical geographer and come up with a post-structuralist understanding of place. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I think there's an important aspect to how we interrogate what place is um, in a number of ways. On one level, often urban protection spaces are not sociologically distinctive or divorced from what goes on in camps or settlements. There'll be a life that connects those two areas. So for instance, many families where possible will have split family strategies. So in Uganda, given freedom of movement, you might have one person within a family moving to the city and setting up a business and another part of the family staying in the settlement and there being the movement of goods and services between as part of a household strategy that's selected. The other element we've found is, I mean, one of the things Jeff mentioned is often the move to urban areas is because of inadequate assistance in the camps. We've found in our data quite an interesting dynamic that I think nuances that, where we were trying to explore whether people who moved to cities were more likely to have lived in a city in the country of origin, and people who moved to camps were more likely to have had rural backgrounds. And we didn't see that at all. But what we did see was a class-based distinction, that people moving to urban areas were more likely to have been from educated backgrounds. They were more likely to have had um, parents or a family member who'd been in a high status position, or more likely to have had educated parents. And there are different variables that that could correlate with, but there seems to be a class-based distinction rather than a rural-urban distinction in terms of some of those aspects of background. The other element I think is really important with geography is the way we conceive communities as contiguous or not within urban areas. She's been trying to get your Perfect. Attention. So for example, um, we often think of Somali communities as living alongside one another, Eastleigh in Nairobi, Somali area, Kisenyi in Kampala, Somali area, Bole Mikel in Addis, Somali area. But Congolese disperse much more widely. Um, in Nairobi, for instance, um, there are several Congolese neighborhoods. In Kampala, similarly, several Congolese neighborhoods. In Addis, you see a growing dispersal of Eritreans. So how do we conceive of that notion of place if there's that dispersal? And the final really brief point is on the economics and livelihood side. I think before we think about the economics of urban displacement, we've got to ask what's different about the urban displaced compared to other urban poor populations and other migrant groups. We've identified four variables that we think distinguish refugees potentially in those contexts, institutions, networks, capital, and identity. Some of those are disadvantages, but some of them, like networks that lead to remittances, can be distinct advantages. We need to understand that development gap if we're going to look at programs that are distinctive and different, certainly on the development level. Thanks. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Sorry to cut you all off. Um, really, we could have listened to all of you much, much longer. We have gone over time. Um, and so in the interest of time, rather than taking um, questions from the audience, what I'll do is offer the co-panelists an opportunity to perhaps respond to each other uh, very briefly if there's some particular point that you wanted to um, respond to or address. Um, so we'll do that for... Two minutes each, Max. Two minutes each, Max. All right. No, we, why don't you give it to people? Because at the end, we know each other well. <laughs> okay. yeah, we, we have yeah. a chance to talk tomorrow as well. Why don't we just okay. Give, give All right. Well, that's. Yeah. I, I certainly have my own questions, but um, we be, be happy to take some. Any burning questions? It's, uh, it's Friday. Okay, then we're back to option one. If there is no yes. question. <laughs> All right, option one, uh, it is. You so ask the I, I can ask a question? Yeah. All right, well, I will, then I will take the liberty to do so. Um, as I was listening to all of you speak about the unique and distinctive characteristics of urban refugees in each of these different contexts, um, a question that kept coming to mind for me was about the, the new and developing technologies of humanitarian aid distribution. Mm -hmm. um, and also then, I think, correspondingly, the technologies uh, that have developed and continue to de develop for governance. Um, because as I think maybe Nasser you had said, the, or maybe it was Jeff, that the, um, the movement away from camp or the idea of the camp or the reality of the camp and into the urban environments um, means that how national governments and international organizations are then uh, dealing with and addressing the concerns and capitalizing on the opportunities has to change. Um, and so I'm just wondering what role technology might be playing um, in each of the, the cases. Great. No, not that one. <laughs> I'm the worst person to ask about technology. About technology? <laughs> no, technology is actually, uh, we can see it from both ends, from the, uh, from the response machine and the way technology has been used. Uh, in some instances, overused, like the IRIS system to control, to know, is being celebrated as a, so to, to register them through the IRIS system. It has its values, of course. But also using uh, this combined debit card that can get all the assistance into it, which was very useful in terms of even getting, not only uh, allowing refugees to use it in a, in a seamless way, but also getting a lot of big data around their movement, where they are, and so on and so forth. But that's from the uh, high-tech end. But I'm more interested in how refugees themselves actually have managed to utilize the technology. And it's cheap. Uh, I mean, a lot in Europe were surprised that those who moved to Europe, have, you Syrians or refugees, who had smartphones. A smartphone is now a basic, <laughs> basic need, right? So, I mean, and they're cheap, they're affordable, maybe you can get a piece for $70, $80, uh, and you get $4 a month f for the WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is the most used um, uh, social uh, 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 networking or social communication system. But that's, of course, to communicate with their family, with their friends. But the way I've seen it, and we documented it in a case study, so there's this guy who used to be in Syria, actually used to be in Yarmouk, and he's a Palestinian Syrian, and he used to be some kind of a local figure. I think he was a teacher, and his wife was a pharmacist. So when they left the Yarmouk, I mean, they were displaced, he grouped his community around a WhatsApp group. So those who live in uh, Gaza town in Bika are called the Yarmouk from Gaza, and those who live in Shtura are in one group, and those who live in Zahli. So he's created those 3,000 people around different groups in the WhatsApp. And what happens, so they actually, could, he, he's, he's now the nodal point, or the focal point, or the in-between point. So they talk to him if, if someone needs assistance to cover certain operation, and so on. So he connects directly with a Palestinian who's living in, actually a real case, living in Sweden. So he, she would send them, and then they take pictures, it's easy to take pictures of the medical bill, or the doctor's diagnosis. She sends back for $100. She sends the code, go to the Western Union, pick the $400. They take pictures, they send it back. It's very interesting way how actually refugees have managed or have managed actually to use the technology for their self-help. 
uh, definitely it needs those who are better off in terms of knowing how to use it and to connect. But I've seen this quite, you know, very interesting that uh, part of the agency of refugees that usually goes unreported by <laughs> a lot of the researchers or the those who are uh, working in the field. Because we always see refugees as you know, subjects of our assistance and they need, you know, vulnerable and they need our assistance. And the matter, as a matter of fact, a lot of what we see happening in Lebanon has to do with some of their agency and they've been coping with it. So that was an example. I don't know if I answered you, but I think it's a good story about technology. If I may add as well. So, so the, the cash cards that was mentioned, I mean, they've been instrumental to improving the response and it, it makes the response more efficient because several agencies are are, I mean, grouping and pooling their funding uh, and dispersing it on one ATM card. So instead of uh, the, the refugees receiving some food assistance from one partner and some uh, shelter support from another partner, you receive all the support on one ATM card, which has obviously uh, uh, made the response in Lebanon more efficient, but is also uh, something that has been been now studied and kind of replicated in Turkey and other uh, localities. So that's something that you will see for the years to come, and especially in the urban response that allows for a completely different planning of the response. You were mentioning also the governance, and that's maybe <laughs> the more critical question uh, on, on the use of technology, because the use of technology in, in um, the governance systems in uh, Lebanon is not particularly so sophisticated. Uh, I haven't seen that many fax machines uh, sin since the 80s. Uh, and that was uh, actually the day-to-day -day communication with some of the municipalities was fax machines, uh, or even driving to deliver uh, some of the reports. Um, and that's... Uh, telex as well. It's in telex, <laughs> all, of, all of it. <laughs> uh, so, so what we did also, I mean, in, in parallel with, with developing uh, urban data, was also to build the capacities of the local authorities to establish, I mean, local technical offices that could be part of collecting data, but building up GIS systems and, and data systems that allow them to do the planning, but then eventually also digitize um, uh, their planning systems. And, and now there is a program coming up now funded by the EU, which involves, I mean, um, a full capacity building on on uh, economic planning, on on the spatial planning, etc. In kind of a new upgraded uh, format at the local level, and not starting only at the national level. That that is happening with some some larger uh, funding streams from the World Bank and and the EU. But you need to also build the capacities and and some good local examples on how that can function. Yeah, um, just really brief comment. I mean, I think smartphones is kind of the big distinction between camps and urban. The, the level of smartphone uptake is much higher, partly because of availability, but also partly because of access to broadband, certainly in East Africa. The thing I wanted to add was about sort of uses and opportunities. Um, one of the things we've found is smartphones are not just used socially. They're often a key part of livelihood strategies, and money transfer is, is a huge part of that. Um, the other potential is to integrate within education and entrepreneurship, um, technology as a whole. So things like um, a whole variety of organizations are trying to provide content that can be available online for training, education, vocational training. Um, <laughs> also with sort of multimedia platforms that involve people facilitating that, but also it provides access to that content. Um, but also even things like coding for education um, has probably been overdone in some refugee communities, but generally the feedback I've heard has been extremely positive from that kind of thing. I don't really have much to add. I mean, basically, um, we had, when, when the camps were the priority, um, the IT came in and made life easy. Um, and uh, you'll be surprised how many people have got their mobiles and they got, they're on internet. I think as people moved out to the outside the camps, this is where the government was challenged, the people were challenged, but um, th there was been no really um, electronification of the system as yet. So I think what you described for Lebanon is pretty much what the United Nations 
agencies do sometimes, but they're mostly for data collection sometimes. Mm -hmm. But Iraqi government, as well as KRG, they have a system of, now they call it WhatsApp, <laughs> okay? What, uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp G or something, WhatsApp Refugee, WhatsApp IDP. And they connect everybody, so disseminate information, call out for rations. And so, yeah. Education is now, um, there's more internet uh, extended to those camps. So I, I cannot really comment so much on how the uh, digital technology will have transformed their lives. So all I can say is that it's increasingly uh, relied upon, but not much I can say. Sorry. We, we, we witnessed something in Lebanon because of the borders. Uh, many Syrians who live around the borders actually they keep, they still keep the Syria uh, network. So there are like certain hills where you see tens of people going out to them. And of course, some of the Lebanese um, xenophobes think they're taking from the Lebanese, <laughs> that's from the Lebanese, you know, uh, network. Uh, so we need to stop that. And uh, actually, I got this live on radio. You have to stop this. <laughs> this is taking from our network. But actually, it's a useful way to connect with their families. Mm. And as a matter of fact, they should encourage it. Because if the Lebanese government wants them to go, that's the, 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 the aim at the moment, they need to connect very well with their community to know if it's actually safe for them to go back. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, we are looking forward to your talk tonight, Alex. Um, if you're interested, speaking of technology, uh, Jeff is wonderful to follow on Twitter. Uh, I, I do actively read your tweets and the links that you provide. And if you're interested in following our project further, hashtag Urban3DP is the uh, tag we're using for the project moving forward. And so we look forward to engaging each other and with you all into the future. So let's take a moment and thank the wonderful panelists. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have to bring you over to the next. It's not going to be too late for you. The perfect amount of snark. I've upset a few people recently. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I, I follow with, uh, with yeah, pleasure. Because after, you know, after that horrible crash in, in Ethiopia, the air crash, everybody immediately worried. It isn't that like like humanitarian workers are being killed. It's if humanitarian workers are something special. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, isn't it tragic that everybody's killed? Yeah. Yeah.